Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Global Forum this evening. My name is Joanna and I'm serving as a Global Forum Fellow at iHouse this year. Um, and I want to welcome you all tonight. If this is your first time attending Global Forum, um, welcome again. Global Forum is an ongoing event series hosted by International House um, that aims to facilitate understanding and discussion about topics that affect our world. Uh, we strive to pro promote a culture of open-mindedness and mutual respect and seek to foster global citizenship among UCSD students, faculty, staff, and community members. Um, I also want to express our appreciation for our program partners for this evening, uh, the Fulbright Association, San Diego chapter, as well as uh, Global Education at UCSD, um, the International Faculty and Scholars Office at UCSD, the International Students and Programs Office at UCSD, and Study Abroad at UCSD. Okay, so a few reminders before we begin the program this evening. I um, wanted to let you all know this event is being recorded and will be posted on the Global Forum Facebook in the coming weeks. Um, to give you an itinerary for um, the program this evening, we'll begin with a facilitated conversation and then we'll move into an audience Q&A where you can ask your questions. Um, so please direct any questions you have during the meeting via chat to the discussion leader who we will meet in just a moment or use the raise hand function to ask, to ask your question verbally during the audience Q&A segment. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce um, Jay Meinert, uh, who is going to be our discussion leader for this evening. Uh, Jay has worked in the Peace Corps and served as an academic advisor at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, and he is currently the Director of Outreach and Engagement and Study Abroad UC San Diego. Uh, during his time at UC San Diego, Jay has received a Fulbright International Administrators Award to the United Kingdom. So again, please direct your questions to Jay in the chat. Um, so now I'll pass the virtual mic to Jay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joanna, and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jay Minert, and it's such a pleasure to have all of you here. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to take a moment um, to acknowledge that uh, the UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land that we are, that our campus is on, and um, for the original people of the area where our campus is located. Um, the university is built on the unceded territory of the Kumaye Nation. And today the Kumaye people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. So we want to acknowledge their tremendous contributions to our region and really thank them uh, for their stewardship. Um, I always try to um, open up any um, program that, that we do with that, with that acknowledgement. Um, having said that, um, it is an honor for me to welcome our um, author to, uh, to you this evening. Um, let me just take a few minutes just to um, introduce David and then I'll have David just kind of um, start his talk and maybe give an overview of the tremendous work that he did in um, in Hawaii and in Wyoming on this on this great book. Um, David Wollman is a contributing editor at Outside and a longtime contributor at Wired. Uh, he's written for publications such as the New York Times, I've heard of that one, uh, New Yorker, Wall Street Journal, and the Smithsonian. Aloha Rodeo was an NPR best books of the year, and it won the 2020 Oregon Book Award for nonfiction. His work has been anthologized in the best American science and nature writing series, and he was a finalist for a national magazine award. David's other books include The End of Money, A Left Hand Turn Around the World, Writing the Mother Tongue, and First Hand. David lives in Hawaii and Oregon with his wife and two children. And I want to thank uh, David and welcome him to the Global Forum. Um, just to get started, David, um, I would love for you to just kind of give us an overview of what the book is about um, and uh, just kind of start things off there. Sure. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Jay. And uh, everyone, nice to uh, ECU, I guess, here on Zoom. And um, thank you to Fulbright and the various UCSD organizations that made this hour possible. I'm um, looking forward to um, a feisty conversation with all of you about all things Hawaii history. Um, so I'm actually uh, on this call right now from uh, Waimea on the big island of Hawaii, where I have been living uh, for about a year now. And this book tells the story of uh, really the hidden story of um, cattle culture and cowboys in, in the Hawaiian Islands. And in 1907, a one-armed Hawaiian cowboy named Eben Lowe 
traveled to Cheyenne, Wyoming to attend Cheyenne Frontier Days, which at the time was the biggest rodeo in the world. And he got the bright idea while watching the steer roping competition from the stands uh, that he thought his cousins could beat these guys. And so before the festivities even closed, Eben Lowe was already schmoozing with the organizers saying, I've got this great marketing idea. You gotta bring my cousins over from the Big Island for, for 1908. So in 1908, these three Hawaiian cowboys showed up at, um, on the biggest stage in the world to compete in steer roping. And, and we can talk more about how they were received by the locals uh, and by white cowboys. A lot of people were um, curious about them, but no one really saw them as a threat. Uh, and because I don't think it's too much of a giveaway or a spoiler for this kind of book, uh, they really kicked butt. And they returned to Hawaii as heroes at a time that was really um, fragile and sensitive for the Hawaiian people because it was very soon after the forced annexation, the forced takeover of the Hawaiian kingdom by the United States. And so, okay, there's your breezy summary of the sucker. And what happened to me, you know, as a journalist, when you're an, an writer of nonfiction, the problem I have is you're never really turning it off, your interest in stuff out there. Oh, you know, like toothbrushes. Wouldn't a book about toothbrushes be super interesting, right? So this is a, a disorder, full on. And while on a vacation to the islands many years ago now, I bump, I, there's a tiny little, uh, Hawaiian cowboys are called Paniolo. There's a tiny little museum dedicated to the Paniolo history here in Waimea. And on the wall was this crooked framed photo of our hero of the story is named Iku Purdy. And it's even like dusty. The frame is even dusty. And it has this five sentence paragraph about what happened. Um, a little bit like what I just gave you to open, but even more boring. And, you know, just like your Wikipedia thing, these three guys went to Wyoming, they won, that's it. And right away, I was like, what? what? What is the story there? And of course, there are some steps between here and there, but that's the very breezy version of how I got interested in this subject and then really dug in and was able to see that it connected to much broader, interesting ideas. It's not just about steer roping, right? It's colonialism and Hawaiian history and indigenous rights and annexation and um, blah, 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 blah. So I knew I was off to the races with this thing. And that was, um, you know, maybe three years ago or so. And now, um, as you can tell, I love talking about this story. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun one. So there you have it. Okay, yeah, and you're right. I mean, it's such a wonderful story. And um, I have recognized a couple of names um, in our audience of people who've been to Hawaii and have um, experiences in Hawaii, as I did, you know, my son was born right there in Waimea. And, um, you know, it's a fantastic place and just a wonderful story. Um, and as we got to know each other on our call um, a few days ago, you mentioned, I believe you're, you're not from Hawaii, you're from Boston, right? And um, I'm just wondering, you know, since you're not from Hawaii, um, were you worried that this was your story to tell? And, and you know, we talked about appropriation and, um, you know, how you felt about going about doing your research. And so can you share with us kind of what your thoughts were around that and kind of where, where some feelings are now? Yeah. Um, you know, without doing a whole dissertation on the subject, mm -hmm. but the short answer to your question is, is yes, you know, from the starting gun or even before submitting a book proposal, there is this sense of, you know, who am I to go write this, this faraway story about a culture and history that is, that is not my own. And I have, I have some broad opinions about that idea. And then I have sort of how I decided I, I could still do this in a responsible and um, deliberate and humble manner and hopefully create a product that is inclusive and thoughtful and not full of outsider bravado. Like, I think I can execute. And, and I'll sort of line up for you with some of the steps that I um, took to try and ensure that that was the case. And then, you know, after our call is over, you can decide, but it was, <laughs> you know, not to my face. No, I, um, so one, one opinion I have on the matter is that I think, I think it's really dangerous, dangerous for all of us to, worry so much about whether a story is ours or not that we foreclose on curiosity 
about other people and other cultures and other histories, right? Because the logical, the end point to that way of thinking is that I, you know, David Wollman should only be writing memoir about 46 and a half year old guys from Newton, Massachusetts with two kids and grew up Jewish, but has discarded that and went to such and such summer camp and is right, it's just me and my micro tribe. And, you know, obviously that's sort of a sarcastic version of it, but, but, but it isn't in a way it, when talking about the publishing industry more broadly, because what happens then is you would end up with a society where we're so cloistered within our own tribes that we are not learning from, from others' stories and more so, or at least in this case, delighting in other stories. And so I, I wanted to go after this thing, knowing that, that the appropriation question is front and center. So, and, so that's the opinion a little bit, but I, and it's obviously like one, we could, we could spend this whole hour talking about that. But, and as a journalist, I think, right, it's part of my constitution to want to go out and tell other stories and learn about the world and do, do as a grown up what I did doing study abroad, right? Which is just go be crazy curious about things and write in your journal and interview people. And um, so I would hate to live in a world where, um, where we're, we're preventing them or, or totally foreclosing on them. Okay, so how on earth did I go about it? You know, I'm talking about trying to do this sort of thing responsibly. And you can sort of break it into three general categories. One is the research and, and reporting. One is the writing and editing and kind of the final checks of the story. And then the final one is sort of how you talk about it in the world. Um, with the first one, you know, we were very sensitive to our privilege and our point of view as, and by our, I mean my co-author Julian and myself. Um, how we come to the material we're reading. What does it mean to dig up a 1898 newspaper article from the Honolulu Advertiser written in English about Hawaiian cowboys? Or what does it mean to get a Hawaiian translate, get a translation of Hawaiian newspaper articles from that era and then read them through the lens of a New Englander? Um, another really important thing, and this is this has to do with appropriation, but honestly, it's really just like reasonable person's research, I would call it. So when, for example, when um, cattle first arrived in the Hawaiian Islands, they were a gift from Captain George Vancouver um, from the Queen to, or from the Crown to um, the Hawaiian Kingdom. This is at the very end of um, the 18th century. And there were these accounts from mariners on the beach reacting to these giant mammals running up and down the beach They've never seen anything like this before. The largest animals that Polynesian people had been exposed to were pigs. And so the people are responding or are kind of freaking out. Now, of course, I wasn't there, but there are these young mariners who were on that ship who have detailed those, those first hours or minutes of interaction between Polynesian people and cattle. Now you look at that material and you're like, on the one hand, this is amazing. What a resource. There were people right there. On the other hand, these young men, they were all men, were you know, 19, 20, 21 year old white guys from, from England or Canada or the United States um, who were as ignorant and as bigoted about the place they had just landed as humanly possible. And by ignorant, I don't even mean that as a judgment, right? Like they had never been there. And so certainly that that bias or that lens or that bigotry is going to color their journal entries. So you have, you can't just relay, I can't just relay to the reader what I'm, what I'm reading in those journals. You know, you really have to do some interpreting. And one thing Julian and I tried to do is kind of talk to the reader about some of those passages and talk about that obvious uh, bigotry that we're seeing in that, in that text. But also, again, go back to the fact, that, wow, we can sort of paint a picture of what that first day was like, and that's, that's worthy. Okay, so that's during the research. To speed it up a little bit, while well, doing the writing and editing, there was a lot of consultation with Hawaiian people, Hawaiian scholars, scholars of this particular history. Um, and, and, you know, you could call it kind of a souped up version of fact check. It's one thing to just make sure you have a date right. But do you have sort of the the cultural, historical lens. Do you have that, do you have that gist right? Um, and 
for me, you know, related to that is making sure that you know, this is not some soapboxy opinionated thing. You know, I, I think my opinions about colonialism as a phenomenon are pretty apparent in the prose without this being like an op-ed piece. And you can do that by just telling what happened, right? My, my sort of the altar that, that I pray at for journalism is just tell what happened. And, you know, maybe later, like in the final quarter mile of this marathon of writing an article or a book, you can have some pretty sentences. You know, you could do some polish, but just tell what happened. That's your responsibility. And so with this book, you know, we're, we're not out to really um, level judgment on the different populations that we're portraying. But again, by just telling what happens, you know, it's not, it's not rocket science to see who is, um, who's the victim here and who's the aggressor when it comes to imperialism and all that. And the final thing with this long answer to like, how did I not make their story my own or at least attempt to not make this, their story mine uh, is the nearly completed manuscript went out to again, like the same group of scholars and experts. I also tracked down some descendants of our heroes in the story. Uh, one of the three cowboys is named Archie Ka'awa and his great grandson, who at the time was a business student at Wharton in Pennsylvania. Um, I sent him a draft of the manuscript, you know, and I bite my nails, like waiting for a response. And, and he loved it. And he said to me, honestly, what a lot of people have said since then, you know, not, you know, David, you're terrific, you're amazing, like you should get paid more. No, he didn't say anything like that. He said, he said, you know, I knew this story in, in broad strokes. Thank you so much for uncovering so much rich detail and being able to just like put so many, you know, it wasn't a meal before. It was like, like the first little appetizer. And now they can really, you can really see it. The rise of cattle culture, the three cowboys journey, by boat and then by train from Oakland all the way to Cheyenne, what happened to them in Cheyenne, what was the broader impact, you know, so, so I, and that, of course, as a writer, like from any, from any group like that, to get that kind of thank you is um, incredibly gratifying and validating, you know, you're, it's important to not write for them, you know, I'm, because then, then you're doing PR, like I am not writing this book for their approval, uh, I am writing, you know, for UCSD students or, you know, my grandmother's cousin's friend who teaches piano in Atlanta. You know, I just made that person up. But like people who don't know anything about this because you're trying to draw people in to be interested in a thing that they knew nothing about before. And even better, the thing they didn't, they didn't know they'd be interested in. And, and hopefully I've, I've pulled that off with, with Hawaiian cowboys here. Oh, that's, yeah, that's excellent. And, and I think that um, just from, you know, having lived there and, you know, this very intricacies of race and, you know, to be Hawaiian and, and I think you touched brilliantly on it. Um, you're authentic, you know, you, you incorporated those voices within your research. You didn't just forego them. And uh, I think, you know, that's, that's the key. And so, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I house uh, coordinator, uh, Alan um, submitted an interesting question that, that I'd like to, uh, to ask of you, and, and, and this is more for the audience. Um, what are some next steps that you think students who might be in attendance today um, might wanna take to learn more about the events um, that, they, that they're reading about in, or have read about in Aloha Rodeo? Because you know, when, when you get a visitor coming to Waimea for the first time, you know, a lot of times it's like, whoa, there's cowboys in Hawaii, Paniolo, never heard of that, you know, and it blows their minds, right? right? And, and so it's not a well-known, certainly on the continent. And so um, if our students had the opportunity to get to Hawaii, um, what are some present day locations that, uh, locations that they should visit that um, relate to that particular historical period? You know, and I haven't really done this. I probably should for friends and family that even are coming to visit the island. I come up with a little itinerary, not that I want to be a tour guide, but, um, you know, on the one hand, there are ways to just learn about it directly, right? So you have to take some time away from your beach vacation to go up to Waimea and visit um, the Pukulani stables. And I can put that in chat or follow up with you guys later, but there's a little Paniello Heritage Center here where they have some of that. There's also a great little museum in the town of Konoka, which you were mentioning to me in our chat the other day, Jay, um, that kind of blends the sugar history with some more of this upcountry, as they say, cowboy stuff. Um, and then, you know, another thing you can do is, you know, after having memorized my book, uh, is you, 
you can make your visit to a place like the Big Island uh, just a little more informed, right? Like the Captain Cook, Kealakekua Bay area. Um, it's very popular for snorkeling and kayaking and seeing dolphins and things as it should be. But to know that that's actually the beach where Vancouver landed with those first emaciated, seasick, really unhappy cattle that had to step off the boat onto the beach there. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just a half a second thought that might inform your visit a little more. It's something you can picture um, before you go do snorkeling and other awesome vacation things. And similarly, when you drive up the coast here, uh, and I'm on the west side, or by the coast, I mean the west side of Hawaii Island, you can still see the stone corrals that were erected you know, by hand, these big giant lava rocks to make corrals down by the shore where the animals would be herded from up here, you know, four or 5,000 foot elevation down the slopes of Mauna Kea to the beach. Then they would be put in these stone corrals and then one at a time, uh, we'd go out into the surf and, and get them onto the steamships and off to market, which is a process we can talk about later or we should because it, we can say sharks, which you wanna say in like every Zoom call ever. Um, so, so, you know, I love when I drive down there sometimes to visit friends or even take my, my daughter to a tennis lesson or something, I can, I look out at this ring of stones in the field there uh, and think about all the people zooming by who just know nothing about that history. Um, and it's not that they're ignorant or terrible, you know, they're vacationing. And after COVID, you know, God love them, they should be vacationing. But um, th there are these features in the landscape that are subtler, but they help tell or kind of animate the story of, um, of cattle in the islands and of course, um, Peniolo history itself. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember, you know, we were talking about um, just the fact that they laid a railway track on that. I mean, just incredible infrastructural um, stuff. And, you know, living, having lived in Hilo, we had talked about the sugar industry and um, kind of like the cattle industry. It's, 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 uh, it's pretty um, remarkable and it's worth taking some time if you're visiting the island, especially the big island to learn more about it. Um, in terms of your um, research um what are a couple of things that surprised you the most about your research um things that really stuck with you for whatever reason the first one and, and we touched on this in our brief um get to know your chat the other day is kind of the the overlooked role of cattle in colonialism itself especially in the pacific you know tahiti got a bunch of cattle and other places and as we write about in the book, you know, on the one hand, these, these were gifts in the gift giving sense of it. Um, and that was sort of a form of diplomacy at the time. So that um, <laughs> these vessels from Europe like wouldn't be um, destroyed and, and they, people could start to interact and trade things. But there's something else, you know, very um, important at play here, which is kind of, you know, we say it almost tongue in cheek in, in the book, which is to make these faraway places look a little more like England. And um, I was incredibly ignorant about that fact. You know, Hawaiian cowboys rodeo, like there's this kind of fun sports element to this story. Uh, and they're really complicated race issues. But when it comes to colonialism, we don't think about it in terms of like, oh, I know. We'll give them some cows and then those cattle because they don't know what to do with them will reproduce like crazy and it, and they're going to eat all the native vegetation and suddenly they're going to have rangeland and like then we can sort of um advise them i.e um gain more power here and that's really what happened in this place and so the first cattle came and i'll sort of zoom through the history but you know, within 20 or 30 years because the king put um, a taboo on killing the cattle. So they, they wanted to know, they wanted to help them try and reproduce. Well, after a few decades, they had 20,000 head of cattle running roughshod over this island, which is only the size of LA County. And it was a total menace, you know, destroying gardens, goring people. They had these racks of like five or six foot horns. Um, so it was a total catastrophe and they, they kind of needed help right away. And so the king in Hawaii at the time had heard about the Spanish vaqueros in California and uh, the ranches that were in operation there. And so first they actually just hired a bunch of hunters 
uh, but that didn't work, do enough to like call the population. And so they understood this idea or they got from the vaqueros, this idea, we need to control the animals with boring things like fences and, and moving them and castration, all, you know, all this like running a ranch business. So the vaqueros came, they taught the Hawaiians and very quickly the Hawaiians got very good at it. And going back to your original question of like, what's surprising to me, uh, and, and you know, I think I sort of geek out a little bit on numbers sometime, but in 1900, one third of all of Hawaii's acreage was allocated to rangeland, right? So it's not sugar, it's not beaches, it's not tourist hotels, it's not even taro fields. It's so that cows and to a lesser degree, sheep and goats can graze. And it's just one of those numbers that's kind of billboardy to me that says like, this is not some fringe thing. If you're interested in Hawaiian history, this is not some fringy corner of it. The other thing or one other thing that really stuck out from the research and um, is the sharks, you know, there we have them. So one of the reasons that Hawaiian cowboys are, um, you know, unassailable badasses, I guess, for lack of a, a more academic term, is that after have after, first of all where they have to ride and rope is just outrageously difficult if it's not deep gulches and ravines covered in rainforest then they're going down these lava fields all the way to the pacific ocean and we're talking by all the way down i mean there are the cattle up at like seventy eight thousand feet up on mauna kea so they have to come all the way down to the coast over a period of days from really cold it's just crazy hot, you know, they have to kind of time everything so the cattle don't um, starve and, or die of thirst. Then they get down to the beach and now what, right? So there are these giant steamships parked outside the reef because they can't come into shore and they have to get the cattle out there. And so there are teams using what are called longboats um, where you have one person at the oars and then they would tie, they would, one at a time, they would herd the cows into the surf with a little dog sometimes like nipping at their heels. Then the cowboys with these horses that were very good at swimming would swim out to these long boats, which are maybe, I don't know, 12, 14 feet long. And they would tie the animals off by the neck and to the gunwale, to the side of the boat till they had six or eight animals total, sort of three or four on each side. Then the whaling boat, they would row out past the breakers and then they'd have these huge hydraulic lifts to like bring the cattle up onto the steamship to head to Honolulu or to international markets. And sometimes the, um, the sharks would be here sort of nosing for steak tartare uh, as, as we put it in the book. And so there are these crazy episodes of the cowboys, you know, they're, they're already so deep in the water that their horses are swimming. And then a shark will come and um, either try to take a bite or take a bite of a cow and, and how everyone reacts. You know, it's, it's pretty staggering um, to me and, and, and will probably will never cease to be. Wow. Can you imagine? Can you just picture no, it? It's just no. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to do that. yeah. No. And, and you're right. I mean, the, the conditions on the island to be a, a, a Paniolo, just yeah. No wonder they they smoked the the Wyoming uh, cowboys when they right. went into competition. Definitely, um, definitely. You know, interesting about how you approach this book and how you approach your work. Um, we had an we had a question from an attendee um, who who wanted to know how many people were you able to interview for this book? How many hours of interviewing did it take you in order to get the story? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. You know, we. I don't know, maybe 20 interviews here, 20 interviews in Wyoming. Julian and I kind of, there was sort of an organic division of labor at first with the research. I kind of took the Hawaii stuff and he sort of took the Wyoming things and very quickly it all kind of blended together into a big pile. But, um, you know, because I'm, I'm sort of one generation too late to get the story firsthand from a lot of these people. so interviews were essential, like a University of Hawaii at Hilo anthropologist who had written about some excavations on some old ranch land. You know, he's, he's like a, an ace up our sleeve kind of person or um, some of the descendants I'd mentioned earlier. 
but a lot of our research came from um, contemporary newspapers, both in the islands and in Wyoming, and in English and in Hawaiian, because Hawaiian was uh, Hawaii is one of the most literate societies on the planet at the time, uh, largely because of the missionaries. Because obviously, if you want people to to believe the word of God, you have to get them to read it. Blah blah blah. So uh, so they pushed that really hard. And but there were also um, Hawaiian language publications. Um, and then there was also a wonderful dissertation that we found written by a guy in Texas who wrote the history of the Parker Ranch, which is where our cowboys were from, and sort of you know, dominates this island in terms of acreage. And I think that was like 1958, 1959 or so. And that, that was a really effective resource for us. Um, so we had newspapers, there were sort of a few obscure texts, that dissertation, and then, um, you know, being here, doing those interviews, and then some reading kind of more about uh, cattle and its connection with colonialism. That was more on the academic side. And, um, you know, for a book like ours, like you want it to be well-researched. But um, my job is twofold, like to educate and to entertain. And because, and I actually don't think those are mutually exclusive because if you don't entertain in a book like this, you know, Netflix is calling and there's incredible content out there. And so you have to keep the story moving. And I'll actually give you an example of that. And this is a little bit more on the writing side, but it relates to kind of, it, it relates, you know, there's, it's got it. Um, one example is I got really interested in the history of property rights in the islands because you can't really tell the story thoroughly of the rise of ranching here and the takeover by white businessmen of this place and the annexation without understanding like how Hawaiians understood property as sort of collectively owned under the king or under the monarchy before and then the introduction of inalienable rights and sort of a, a European perspective on private property and Putting up bar, you know, putting up fences between what I own and what you own. Um, so this, so this matters to the story. This is the long and short of it. Well, Julian, meanwhile, is up in Wyoming, like researching X, Y, Z, and I send him like a few pages of writing all about this, and he writes me back, kind of sarcastically, like, we're, you know, we're not going to 15 pages in this book about the history of property rights in the islands. Like, we, you know, we could have a few paragraphs, but. And he's right, you know, you have to really make sure that nobody's gonna start snoozing on it. And, and he ended up doing the same thing, by the way, with all these tangents in Wyoming, he wanted to introduce a book. And I was like, what is informing our narrative? Because we're not gonna be able to tell the story of um, Hawaiian cowboys if they're all of these little tributaries and we just can't, we just wanna explore every damn one. Um, and, and you can't do that. That's so interesting. And, and just to kind of touch off on that, you, you mentioned, you know, you, you wrote this book in concert with um, another writer. Um, it, was this the first book that you had done that? Uh, and how was that experience like for you in terms of an author? You know, it's really, now that I've done it and people ask me about it a lot, I, I, I would sort of find myself back in a library or bookstore and see how rare it actually is. You know, often it's like a husband wife team. Um, <coughs> And so, so it's rare. Uh, I had never done it before. I had done it with Julian on a magazine store. And interestingly, it had sort of the same division of labor idea. I focused on this one guy and kind of his backstory largely at first, which was a pretty solitary endeavor. And Julian is doing it for sort of main character B in his backstory. And then later we sort of braid it together. And this sort of had that with Wyoming and Hawaii. And, and you know, for the next book, I don't think it would work at all. Um, it worked well this time. I don't think it would work well for everyone. You have to, you have to have tough skin, like even tougher than you need anyway to be a writer and sort of take those shots. But we both do. Um, we had sort of some, a lot of conversation back and forth on Slack. Actually, we had a little Slack channel between the two of us. And, you know, a lot of just like... Um, really insulting one another and, and what we were doing, but, but in, you know, uh, humorously, I think, and, and obviously with the silly, like the singular purpose of making the prose sing and making it really fat free. Uh, and, you know, people have said nice things to us since then about how it, it reads rather seamless. Like you can't tell like, oh, Julian wrote this part, David wrote that part. It kind of has been successfully blended, which is, you know, a feels great, but B, 
it's like, it better be at this point because we passed it back and forth. You know, we worked on that together so much. You know, by the end, I really believe in a read aloud. So we were like sitting in his apartment, like late at night, just, just, okay, I'll read this chapter to you. And because you have to figure out how the words sound with your storytelling. And that's not just a literary and writing idea. You know, that's just as important for some of what you were asking me at the start of this chat, Jay, about appropriation or, or diversity or your research, you know, oh, wow, the way, now that I read that out loud, um, we, we don't need to identify the name of that newspaper there in that passage, for example. You know, this would sound better if we said, according to one Wyoming newspaper, sports reporter, dot, dot, dot. And so it actually relates that, how the whole thing sounds really does relate to the success of, or failure of, of the whole endeavor. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, no, I'm glad it worked out so well. It sounds like a organic, natural um, kind of working relationship. And so Julian was in Wyoming mostly, and you were in Hawaii. Well, no, and we're, you know, we're still friends, so that's that part's good. No, he, we're, we're both we're living in Portland. Um, okay. Okay. But he went to Wyoming to do sort of more of the Wyoming based stuff um, and visit some museums and some archives there. I was here. Actually, we both went to Honolulu also to spend a good amount of time in the state archives here. But then I, I sort of had a, two or three additional research trips here. Okay. I'm going to choose Hawaii over Wyoming. No offense, Wyoming. <laughs> good call. Good call. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So, you know, we touched on this um, a little bit in our answers and, and discussion, but I, I'm, I'd love for you to kind of delve a little bit deeper for um, those of us on the call who may not be aware of the annexation, the illegal annexation of Hawaii, which happened, as you said, just right around that time of, of your research. Um, the, the issue of race in Hawaii, you know, just very multi- ethnic multicultural place, as we all know, um, but there comes issues with that, right? And, um, and, and especially when you juxtapose a Hawaiian to, as you said, the, the cowboys in Wyoming. Um, can you just give a quick primer for, for our audience about what was illegal annexation all about and, and race in Hawaii? I know it's a big question. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a huge question, but um, you know, the, the very broad strokes is that um, this place was an independent, peaceful, sovereign nation for a long time. And after um, contact with the European and North American um, interests and governments, um, that there was pressure for that to change. There was a time when Hawaii was kind of really leaning toward um, joining the British empire, but um, business interests here, American business interests here, specifically sugar, um, made sure that didn't happen. And toward the very, toward the end of the 19th century, there was a, for the most part, not bloody uh, takeover of this place by the United States, uh, sort of tucking it into the fold pretty quietly with Guam and Puerto Rico and the Philippines and uh, not so quietly necessarily. But, um, you know, we're very quick to think of like the, the imperial nation of all imperial nations is, is um, Britain. And, you know, America has done some serious uh, territorial acquisition over the years. And so, um, you know, I, I, this is almost a criminal gloss, you know, because lots of things have been happening before that, right? So even just the arrival of people from Europe introduced all kinds of disease, which just completely walloped the native population. By some estimates, 90% of native Hawaiians died because of foreign introduced diseases. And that's not a political thing. Uh, would your question speak specifically about annexation, but it's part and parcel of a tragedy. And I think that at the end of the day, that's, that's sort of what is essential to be thinking about here is the tragedy of lost people, lost culture, lost language, you know, in tandem with this takeover. At the same time, you have this really unique blending and arrival of different people from different places. Um, and you know, the sugar industry has often been used to showcase that, you know, in the 1880s, I believe it was, there was a relationship between US and Japan, and they started welcoming thousands of Japanese laborers to work on the plantations. Same thing happened with the Portuguese. Uh, so Hawaii is starting to mix and mix and mix more. But in fact, in the cowboy country, it already was really mixed. And there's a beautiful example from the scholar in Hilo about a site here on Parker Ranch somewhere, they excavated this like 
maybe 12 by 12 old cowboy station. It's like when you're out herding cattle way, way, way out far away, it's too far away to get home for the night. So they spend the night. And even though it's this tiny place, there's um, clear evidence of a Japanese ofuro, like an outdoor bath. And there are stories about how people would arrive somewhere, they would have the poi, which is like a pounded taro to snack on. Then for their other food, they would break off some branches and use them as chopsticks. Uh, and then inside the, this tiny cabin on the floor, there's like an old bottle of cognac. There was a porcelain um, dish that indicated, um, I think it was, Nisa, there was something like a, a connection to China and, and on and on, right? You see all of, it's almost like Hawaii geographically is the most isolated place on the planet as in like no emergency landings between my house and your house right now. But everybody is landing, you know, it's sort of this, the cliche is crossroads of the Pacific and yet it's very real in that there's this kind of dotted line of connection between Hawaii and practically everywhere in the world. And that to me really kind of informed the, 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 the cowboy story in a way. And related to that is sort of, smashing open our preconceived notions about what is a cowboy or cowgirl. And in terms of color of their skin, in terms of their country of origin, in terms of the landscapes, uh, in terms of the geographic boundary of the, the quote unquote American West. Uh, and, you know, in very simple terms that made this project like a real joy for me because anytime you can kind of stick it in the eye of conventional thinking about a thing, uh, not, not for sport, but because the, the material indicates as such, right? That then it just feels great because like John Wayne is not, John Wayne movies should not be shaping how we think about the American West, right? I mean, by some estimates, 25% of cowboys in the American West were African-American. Like these are not numbers that are well known. And of course, popular media, especially from the fifties and sixties kind of distorts our perception of that history even more so. And so for a story like this to be in Hawaii and see this incredible blend of people, um, you know, is pretty delightful. I'll give you one little footnote to that thought, which is that the hero of our story, his name's Ikua Purdy. Uh, his grandfather or great-grandfather had come here from Ireland. And one tiny detail that I learned after publication. Uh, so his, his great-grandfather came from Ireland, but obviously married a Hawaiian. And so he's, he's Hawaiian and technically like um, through his family tree connected to the king. Anyway, I learned after reporting it, it's this tiny detail, but I just love it, is that his beard had like this reddish tinge to it, his mustache, which is prized mustache. Uh, you know, again, connecting back to his, his roots in Ireland. And I just, um, you know, it's one of those things that you learn after the fact, oh, damn it, I wish I'd gotten that in there. But it also adds to this like wonderful uh, blending story that we luckily bumped into. Absolutely, and you mentioned Purdy, that's a well-known name. Uh, you had mentioned that earlier, a lot of the family. Um, and so, yeah, super, super fascinating. Um, we have a question, it's kind of a specific question, but I'm gonna ask it just cause it's right in front of me. Uh, we have a, um, a local, an attendee who looks like he's probably a local brother. Um, just curious if David has interviewed Mr. Franz Salzman. Salmson, I'm sorry, Salmson. Um, he's a retired teacher from Hawaii Prep Academy there in Waimea. Um, he arrived in Hawaii in the 50s to teach at HPA and remained till today. And he did a lot of interviewing of the original residents of Waimea, so he knows a lot about the history. Um, are you aware of Franz? And were you able to no, him? but I'll tell you, um, it sounds like I should. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and as a added thing there, so Hawaii Preparatory Academy is down the street from me, and I am was their sort of writer in residence for this past academic year. And we'll be doing so again this coming year. Um, you know, because of COVID, it was very uh, kind of hamstrung experience for both me and the students, you know, as opposed to just hanging out, having sort of organic interactions. My visits to the classroom were really kind of strategic strike in and out. So I, so I couldn't bump into people like, uh, is it Franz? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. But hopefully, in, you know, knock on wood in this coming academic year, I'll be able to connect with him and, and a dozen more people like him who, who know this history inside now. Absolutely. Yeah. Just stick around Waimea. You'll run into him, I'm sure. <laughs> and that's great. You have an involvement with the Academy too. Um, if you've seen, I think the, it wasn't it in the movie, the, the Descendants, I think, uh, 
Um, Probably. I yeah, yeah, they may have that. mentioned it. Um, yeah, but um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Fulbright. And uh, yeah, this this event um, is is being brought to you in part by the, by our local Fulbright chapter. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about your Fulbright. I also understand you studied abroad in Samoa, um, which you mentioned. Um, I work with the Study Abroad Office, so I have a personal interest in that. And I was able to do a Fulbright myself to the UK. Um, just real briefly, can you touch on your Fulbright and your Yes. If there's some squealing behind me, by the way, I don't know if anyone can hear that, but my daughter and her, the neighbor are playing in a sprinkler because it's quite hot today. And they were asked to not be so loud, but we're coming up on 50 minutes. So I have to be pretty forgiving. And in the age of pandemic, I hope the recipe can be it as well. So anyway, um, anyone who's listening, go do study abroad. Go, go, go. It is the best thing ever and you know for more reasons than I could ever count but it just absolutely tore open my worldview uh, I'd never been outside the United States I was actually lined up to do a program in Indonesia because I just thought it'd be somewhere cool and interesting I didn't know anything about then I got a call that they canceled that program and they said is there somewhere else you want to go um, the the weird asterisk to all this is I went to a college where you I couldn't go to France or Germany or China because those languages were taught at my school and I was not a major in those. And the rule at the time was you, you have to go to you know, Middlebury School in Paris or Middlebury School in Beijing. So if you're, if you're doing study abroad that's not language connected, you have to go to Indonesia or Australia or England or something. So anyway, I turned the page of the catalog after Indonesia is canceled and it's like Western Samoa. And I'm like, where is that? <laughs> and I went and lived there for five months and it was just magnificent. I mean, I learned, um, you know, I, I learned to embrace how ignorant I am about the world and how curious I am to learn more and that those two ideas are not um, in opposition to one another. And, you know, from then on, all I wanted to do was travel more, not because of, you know, travel like with a surfboard and my journal, writing home, like what I did on my summer vacation kind of BS, but because, you know, teaches you that the world is enormous uh, and that your world, your worldview as an individual is, um, is just one. And so I, I cannot recommend, I love where I went to school. So it's not like I was eager to get out of town per se, but I just felt like it was, immensely important for me and my growth. Um, and, you know, quite uh, connected to that is, is Fulbright because, so I did not do a Fulbright sort of act, uh, thing as, I can't even remember how it works. It's usually like just after graduating is the more common one. And then there's this other pile of grants that they offer to like mid-career professionals sort of thing. I was sort of a barely mid-career professional when I got a Fulbright journalism um, research or grant or whatever it's called to go to Japan. And again, I mean, go do study abroad and then use that to tee up a Fulbright because it's, these things um, are irreplace, irreplaceable and, 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 and honestly, immeasurably valuable. I know I sound a little purple here, but it's true. I mean, this stuff is incredible. And so I had a great time in Japan and, and um, was doing journalism while over there, but also, you know, it was part of what became for me this kind of accidental love affair with the Pacific Rim. And obviously that's a big part of the globe, but for a kid from New England, you know, no one I knew ever went vacationed in Hawaii or anything like that. People who need sun go to like Florida. And so then to move, you know, to, to be in Western Samoa from Vermont, then to go to Japan, then I moved to the West Coast and fell in love with the Oregon Coast and was doing, I had some story assignments in the Christmas Islands and New Zealand and Alaska and, and realizing like I have, you know, there's something about the Pacific Rim that just is sucking me back all the time. And then of course this big Hawaii project blossomed. So, you know, I kind of feel home in a weird way, but I also know it's, it's just this like wonderful pile up of accidents that have, have made it so. 
Absolutely. No, that's that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that because um, you know, you, and I actually got a question in the in the chat as you're asking, you know, how how do you make the most or the best out of study abroad? And I think you touched brilliantly on it. And I would always answer, you know, stop hanging out with Americans when you're over there. You know, to hang yeah. out with, hang out with local people. Exactly. And that's a game changer. Exactly. So. Almost to the point of being Kurt. Right. And it's really nice to meet you, Mark right. and Dre and. <laughs> now let me go over here and talk. like i'll see you on the flight home right, uh, right. yeah, yeah the, the true experiences are not i have plenty of friends i had plenty of friends in college like i don't i don't need these particular friends and obviously you don't jerk but you know that that eagerness to be out in the community and outside your comfort zone you know that's how you're making memories slash building knowledge about about a place Absolutely. And, you know, just for the um, um, for the edification of our audience and just knowing more about Fulbright, if you're an undergraduate listening in, um, you know, David mentioned that there are several different Fulbright um, awards that are typically given. Um, we we um, often work with students who, once they graduate, are interested in an ETA or an English teaching assignment. Mm -hmm. um, or as David mentioned, you could potentially do research um, abroad. And so if it's something that you aspire to do after you graduate, certainly, you know, go to fulbright.ucsd.edu. Um, we have folks working right here in the university who can kind of help with your application and, and um, get you thinking through that process. So, um, so yeah, that, that's great you did that david definitely it's worth it and fulbright is well known and so you know definitely recommend to students who want to sort of be engaged globally and and certainly within an international tract so gosh we're already running kind of short on time it's yeah. it's i knew it was going to happen there's so is. much so much um you know what anything else that you would like our audience to know about before we we, we cut them loose anything that you want to share that you feel like yeah. you haven't touched on yet about this story um you know I, I had shared with you and alan and joanna the other day but i i like um i like the complexity of the following idea which is that when i was there's sort of a post um a coda in the book which is in the present day i took a, a couple day trip up over mauna kea with some retired paniolo and some scholars here which is a great window onto to every, all this history I was trying to learn about. And one of the guys was like a young conservationist ecologist type Hawaiian guy, you know, he's a wonderful tattoo of Okia, which is a really important uh, tree here. And we were talking about the cattle and in some back and forth, I used the term of phrase invasive species. And from a rigidly ecological, you know, ecology, perspective on this thing, they are um, an invasive species. Um, you know, introduced from the outside, population explosion, completely transformed the landscape, lost a lot of native vegetation because of them, yada, yada, yada. And he turned to me and said, you know, I think a lot of people in Hawaii would take offense to calling cattle here native, an invasive species. And it totally stopped me in my tracks in the best possible way, you know, being wrong can be so great and informative. And also as a journalist can give you the best material for the damn book or article later. And, you know, he wasn't scolding me or anything, but he kind of was like, oh, you know, it's not so simple. Uh, and he was pointing of course, to like the pride that Hawaiians feel when it comes to Paniolo history. And that this is a subculture within the Hawaiian culture that is very important and special. And obviously, um, inseparable from that idea are the animals themselves. And so to just call them uh, invasive species, which has such a connotation of like a thing we should get the heck out of here. Uh, you know, he, he introduced sort of the, the beautiful complexity of the idea to me. And, it, and it's sort of reflective about Hawaii itself, um, you know, that has done so, so much cultural admixing and that an introduced idea, an introduced practice, introduced animal can then be adapted and made into a specifically Hawaiian practice like slack key guitar and ukulele, right? And, um, I just, I loved that. And, and I will never, whenever I'm reading something about invasive species now, I often think of this guy with his huge biceps and the Ohia tattoo kind of telling me straight, like, you know, be, be respectful of the king's cattle. They're called the king's cattle here, you know? So, um, 
anyway, that was a, a tiny anecdote that is memorable to me. That's that's wonderful. And as you were speaking, I was kind of thinking about the Cokie frog. I was like, will they ever reach that level? You know, and, you know <laughs> stick around long enough. No, there's some long. invasive species that deserve <laughs> they're just invasive our, species. They right? are. They deserve all of our hate, <laughs> hatred and, and then some. That's right. That's right. Well, I wanted to share a couple uh, comments from uh, um, an audience member. Um, somebody mentioned that your book is on Audible, um, and the, the person had never heard of it before, but they've already downloaded it. And so that's wonderful nice. wonderful to hear. And she also wanted to share a, a comment. Her name, is, her name is Ruth. It, it sounds like Hawaii is better for knowing you, and you are bolstering the local culture, so you leave it better then you found it, mahalo. Oh, and, and I certainly share that sentiment. I think um, it's a pretty remarkable journey you've taken and uh, pretty pretty exciting story. And so definitely um, really, really appreciative of you uh, sharing it with us today. Um, we're almost at six. So um, in the interest of time and our audience, um, I just wanted to give a minute, if anyone else has any questions that are burning, send them in the chat my way you have a couple minutes um but uh any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience today david oh no i mean what else to share <laughs> you've uh, already shared so much <laughs> come visit i mean you know come visit hawaii there's there's a big push on now by the, the tourism bureau here to try and get people to Malama, the land, which is um, Hawaiian word for sort of to care for and be mm -hmm. for. And, uh, you know, we got to go on vacation with the family and reach out in the pool and snorkel and all that. But there are programs now that are really, you know, Hawaii, it is a lot of pressure to have 10 million people come here every year. On the other hand, it props up the economy. So there, it's a real tension for this place. Um, but these, these programs, and they're sort of scattershot still and, and kind of embryonic stages but um you know you can go plant koa trees one morning um or see what uh, beekeepers are doing or ocean cleanup and hula and, yeah, yeah and, you know i don't want to call it like I, there are all kinds of cutesy terms for this like service tourism or, sure. I, I can remember the other ones off the top of my head they're kind of nauseating but you know you're it's not that's not the point of your whole visit but to take an afternoon and do something that has a non-trivial impact on the place you're visiting yeah, you know whether Hawaii or Vancouver Island or um, you know Estonia, I don't care. But like just just to think a little more about travel in that in that way, I, I think is is healthy. And so yeah. everyone should book a ticket to visit Hawaii and then try and figure out some way to Mahama like this. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, I I often joke. Um, with my family, we I always look at Hawaii as being kind of two Hawaii's. There are two Hawaii's. There's Oahu and then the rest of Hawaii. And and I know how much dependent on tourism the state is. And thank you for for sharing that that outlook. And, and it makes me wonder, you know, after we've gone through this horrible pandemic and you know everyone has had to kind of hit the pause button a bit. I'm wondering how the state and how tourism will will kind of come back in Hawaii and will they do things differently? Will they be a little bit more um, you know malamaing towards the uh, to Towards the environment and towards their message so so we, that remains to be seen obviously mm -hmm. it's wonderful that voices like yours are out there and um and yeah it's just wonderful for you to share your story with us definitely oh, happy to happy to thank you all yeah. for listening it's really it's nice to get a chance to connect with you jay and thank you joanne and everyone for organizing alan of course mm -hmm. um and yeah i'm available you know so if people have some question to me for me down the road you know you can reach out to me the ether and i will more likely than not respond unless it's a harsh criticism of my book in which case I'll be like, i never got your message right <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I'm going to um, I'm going to pass the baton back to Joanna, who's going to close us out. So, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Jay. OK, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen again. OK, thank you so much um, to uh, Jay and David for that conversation. Um, and again, to our partners um, for their part in um, putting on this event and um, also to Alan for dropping those links in the chat. And we'll also be sending out an email um, to our attendees this evening uh, with those links. So stay tuned for that. And um, thank you to all of you for attending and for asking your questions. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Please fill out this feedback form to let us know how you found the event this evening and what we can do to get better. And um, thank you all so, so much. Have a great evening. Mm -hmm.